alternate delivery program. Tim is actually teaching uh, this summer. Um, and this is one of those sort of cases where we're, we're figuring out as an institution, you know, what do we want to do and how do we go forward with it. Uh, a, a real problem we're trying to solve is that we just don't have enough classrooms uh, for the size courses that uh, Tim and Tyson uh, teach. Uh, I hope that they will be coming, uh, but uh, Katie Morris from Social Work and Chris Swan from uh, Geography will be coming as well. Uh, we've sent uh, uh, messengers, they may have gone to an old room <laughs> where we used to do this workshop in, so we're gonna, we're gonna see if that uh, has been the case. So what, what I'm gonna do is just sort of uh, start it, open it up, but by all means, you're more than welcome to ask your own questions in terms of uh, what works or what doesn't. Uh, I've told these folks they are free to tell you what doesn't work. Uh, this is not going to be real if we don't at least address you know, some of the issues. And what I think I would open up with this is you guys know the drill. We've done this in the workshop before where we talked about uh, a particular problem that you wanted to solve. Maybe to help us frame your comments, could you talk about a particular problem that you thought you were going to solve and whether or not you did with hybrid delivery? So okay. I'll turn it to you, either one first? of you guys. I was just going to go this way. <laughs> so go, yeah. go I ahead. guess my, uh, my opening comment would be, I don't think there's anybody in this room named Rebecca, right? Right. Is that right? No, no, just sure. being sure. Okay. 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 Um, when I did this, I think it was January right. that I did this, um, among the things that I was frustrated about was that the kids didn't know how to use Excel. Mm -hmm. I teach accounting, <laughs> cost accounting, and they had no clue how to use Excel. And I will tell you as I sit here, I haven't solved that yet. Mm -hmm. Chris Swan has been very helpful in some suggestions, uh, but I haven't got that solved yet. Uh, what I'm teaching this summer, um, we don't need to use that so much, but I gotta figure that out for Paul. That said, um, the counsel that Chris gave me was don't do big chunks. Mm -hmm. Little bitty chunks, and if there needs to be, lots of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I started out, you know, go read this chapter. And I've now taken a chapter's worth and split it into six, seven, or eight parts with an assessment after each of those parts and they can't get to the next assessment till they've done the one before perfectly. They have to be 100% on it or they can't get the next one. There are tools in Blackboard that let you do that that are slicker than the sliced bread. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was just the, the thinking about now, I'm a little bit off your question. No, that's, that's fine. But one sec. Uh, when I went through this process and I walked away in our, when we did it, it was a half day followed by the, the next day was the second half day. This, I think, you're all day. Right. But I walked away the first day, my head was swimming. And then things began to develop because these folks, they don't tell you how to do it. They just ask you a bazillion questions, and that's good. But the most valuable piece of it is, I don't, I don't know whether you uh, alerted them to this or not, but you'll get an opportunity to go have a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two with their staff, John's folks. That was the solid gold, folks. And they didn't tell me what to do, but boy, did they ask some tough questions. And you go away and think about them, and all of a sudden light bulbs start going off. So be sure you go do that. Tyson? Question about yeah. Oh, I'm yes, sorry. Tyson. Um, you said that you give them a series of smaller with, right. and they can't move on on Blackboard until they, so how does that work in terms of grading? So that does everyone get an A? No, no, no. no. I mean, you know what I mean? So how does that work in grading in terms of the grading that you do overall in the, in the subject matter or whatever? You have to be a little sneaky sometimes okay. because Blackboard has this tool called Adaptive Release um, and it, it works. But they have to do all of these steps on which they must get perfect scores mm -hmm. 
before they can get to the one that counts. Mm -hmm. oh. They can't even see this one mm -hmm. until so they've done all these others. So, so they don't count. Those they don't count for a thing. Okay. They're the, but they're, they're, the, they're the moving on tool. They're the gate uh -huh. to get to what does count. Mm -hmm. And then they do that, and then that is reported, and, that, and then there's another series to get right. to the next one, and right. et cetera. And right. And so they're kind of linear. Uh, remember, I teach accounting, <laughs> and so we have. There are two parts to that as a practical matter. Okay. Those things that they're stumbling with. Uh -huh. Yes. And sidebar: I force my classes meet in the evening, but I force them to be through with those things by noon on the due day. Oh, okay. And you can go look at grade book and see what they're having trouble with so you know what you need to talk about in class. And then we have to cover the problem. Okay, absolutely, absolutely. I think the greatest challenge that I had before uh, moving to the hybrid model was I spent a lot of time on background. Uh, I teach American politics, uh, Introduction to American Government. And if I referenced uh, uh, Reagan's understanding of federalism or Nixon's understanding of federalism, I would get blank looks. So now with hybrid, I can force them to go and look at the speeches, look at some of the campaign commercials before coming to class. So now they have some understanding and then they can ask uh, these various questions. I also had difficulty moving students out of their uh, predispositions uh, in certain uh, ideological stances on public policy issues. Well, this way I can force them to look at public opinion, look at how changing the wording of a survey question will change the distribution of support for particular things. So I don't have to spend that much time in class uh, trying to explain it. I can have them actually go through it. Okay. Also, uh, there are different levels of knowledge that each student brings to the political process. Some went to schools where uh, they understood a lot of the different things about how you go look for a bill and how do you look for a member's voting record. And that's very difficult sometimes to go through in a classroom setting face to face without having them that, giving that prior exposure. So I do a lot of stuff where students are looking for information about members of Congress, looking for public opinion, actually reading some of the anti-federalist uh, papers that help them understand federalism and then looking at uh, state per capita aid for particular things. And that has been very, very helpful. So my goal, my overarching goal, is to have students become more informed about the American political process. So I agree with those little steps and you have to take them through in order for them to understand the complexity of the American government system. Just to welcome uh, Katie Morris from Social Work. Uh, uh, just to, to fill you in, we're, we're to, as a kind of entree into what your experience has been, we're kind of starting with the question that we've always started with the workshop, you know, kind of what's the problem that you wanted to solve mm -hmm. and how did or didn't you with hybrid delivery, you know, what worked and what didn't? Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, Unless there was a question. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Well, I'm grade heavy, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon your perspective. Um, so I'm heavy on the assessments, and I think that encourages the students, the graded assessment, I, I think that encourages them uh, to do it. Uh, and so we'll talk about, I'll use that as a, an opportunity, a teaching moment. Why didn't you find this information? Well, did you go to this website? Well, we went over it. Uh, there are some websites, as you know, that are not credible, let's just put it that way. And so when students say, well, I found this information here, I'll, I'll say, well, raise your hand if you found the right information. So why do you think, you know, what kind of political knowledge do you gain from going to the wrong website, mm -hmm. getting the wrong statistics? Uh, is there a, a purpose behind providing wrong information to you as a voter? So those are the things that I, I do. And so they figure out quickly that if they get a good grade on the assignment, they're also learning about uh, political information at the same time. Anything else? Oh, 
I teach an um, intro um, social work course, and it's information and technology and social work. And the course I actually did um, just work with um, our department to revise, I guess that's about three years ago now, um, to kind of expand the goals to focus on, um, it is, like I said, an introductory course, kind of what I see as the foundation course. A, a lot of students are really able, I think, to produce or gather a lot of information, mm -hmm. like you said, websites and such. Um, but that evaluation process, I don't think we ever really teach them that. And so this course, the goal, what I have tried to focus on is not only the gathering of information, but the evaluation of it. And therefore, if they are not good sites, to be able to kind of take them back and, and review that. So it's a gathering and evaluation of websites and also of, um, I think the other thing is, is our library has excellent resources. And in our upper division courses, we have a lot of, which I'm, all of us probably now do as departments, have writing intensive courses. And the idea is to tie literature to those courses. Um, so for us, scholarly journals and um, publications. And so I think a lot of students are expected to be able to do that, but they don't really know how and they don't have the tools. So in this um, course, the focus is on um, how to gather those resources, having a librarian visit, and then also having them evaluate those resources. So kind of that precursor step in terms of how you'd integrate this into a paper. Well, first you need to know how to read it and evaluate it. Um, so, and again, I, I missed your name. Tyson. Tyson, okay. I've seen you on a, a couple of the websites. Okay. Then. Um, so as Tyson mentioned, I think a lot of students are coming in with very different um, levels of um, experiences. A lot of my students are um, traditional students, so the 18 to 20 year olds, and then I have also a lot of students who are um, in the field mm -hmm. and have been in the field for maybe 15, 20 years. So they have, you know, maybe experience with the clients that hopefully they'll work with in the future, but they don't have the educational, um, maybe the, the bachelor's to kind of um, back that up. So kind of, I think that's what's difficult in managing any classroom is making sure you're delivering the message to everybody. Um, what's nice about the hybrid piece is that you can put stuff up there um, and say, hey, if you don't know this step, you know, this is step one, this is pre-step one. Mm -hmm. If you don't get this, you can get it there and you can review video lectures or readings or websites or whatever else to help you get, to ensure that you can get to, you know, the step that we're gonna be talking about in class. Um, I think the hardest thing is, is do they do that? <laughs> um, and I think Tyson raised this point too. Uh, the question came up, you know, how do you ensure that they do it? You hope that they do. Um, again, each student is different in terms of how they take their studies too. Some very serious, some are serious but just don't have the time. They have families, career, you know, they're working, they have kids, you know, that you get the gamut of kind of what they're doing outside. Um, I think the thing is, is that I, I try my best to not only provide the information, um, but I think just in reviewing what Fink was talking about, uh, that assessment piece I think is so key to be able to give them some sort of feedback um, you know, if you can weekly or every other week so that they know what, what the expect, I, well, I guess if I could take a step back, I think really setting up the expectation for, you know, what you're expecting of them and then being able to assess that and providing them feedback so that they know for the next time, okay, this is what, you know, is they're looking for, this is what she's looking for. Um, I think for me, um, I actually taught three sections of the course this semester um, as mm. hybrids, and it was a lot to keep up with. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. uh, so I think in terms of that assessment piece, it's hard to do. Um, and I, I guess for myself as an instructor, you know, you learn each semester as you go through, but um, the hardest thing is, is really kind of keeping up with students. And what do you do for those that you know are falling through the cracks? You know, do you let them go? Do you, you try your best to kind of, you know, kind of keep them afloat? And so um, I guess that's the thing that, that is nice. What I like about the hybrid piece is that a lot of students are connected and online and I can connect with them there and they connect with me there. But there's a small percentage who don't. And so that face-to-face -face time is still really important for me to say, hey, you know, Kenny, I haven't seen you on there. What's going on? You know, this is what you need to do in order to be successful in this course. And, and being able to have that face-to-face -face is, is, has been helpful for me to kind of still be able to check in with them if they're not, you know, 
if I don't see them online, so to speak. Not too many assessments, though. Let me stress. Yeah. <laughs> Not too many, because that's, a, I mean, we're being honest. Yeah. One of the things that I it's learned true. is that uh, to do it right, you, you, you know, you're going to be online as much, if not more, than you were before. Yes. And so that does take time from you if you're going to really uh, do the assessment right uh, and make sure that they got whatever you wanted them to get yeah. out of the assessment okay. strategy. So That's hard. Two, two comments, if I can. Um, the first one is uh, the kids want to go to grade book now. <laughs> so the, the second is, is the assessments you do, if they're ones that require your involvement, that's where you drown. You might need some of those, but you don't want to do them all that way. Have some assessments that are self-grading, if you will, mm -hmm. multiple choice, true, false, whatever is your method, um, as opposed to the fill in the blank where if they spell it wrong, you get six emails about, I have that right. You have to think about your assessments, um, right. but ones that will appear instantly in gradebook, they love. <laughs> John. Uh, one of the things you brought up is that you, the, the, the students do fall through the cracks. I was wondering how much of that falling through the cracks is a, is a result of, of being in a That's a good question. I, yeah. I'll tell you what I do. Three weeks before the semester starts, I go out and get the roster. I, admittedly, it's only those registered at that point. And I send them an email, and I tell them what the book is, the ISBN and all of that. So they can go buy it wherever they want. I don't care. But this is the book. And uh, th in that same email, I tell them, that a week or 10 days before the class starts, I'll send them a second email that open, that will tell them the Blackboard site is open, and by the way, you have work to do before the first class. <laughs> <laughs> I, I no longer print a syllabus and distribute it, nothing. You go to Blackboard and get it, and it's an idea I took from this in January. I put up a 20 question quiz on the syllabus that they must score perfectly on or they get nothing else presented to them. When's the first test? Where do you deliver mail? Uh, I mean, if you're not gonna, gonna give your homework in class, where's my mailbox? When are office hours? And all, I mean, whatever it is you wanna know. And I just made it 20 questions and uh, I have a little fun with a couple of them, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. But then those questions magically go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. And instead of spending a bunch of time in the first class meeting, it's who I am, who you are, I ask if there are any questions, and we go to work. It takes all of that away. Mm -hmm. But it, I start three weeks out. I think preparing the students uh, for the difficulty of a hybrid course is important. Uh, I didn't do the three weeks out. I learned the hard way uh, that some students hear hybrid and hear easy. Yes. Um, I don't know how that translation works in the brain, but that's what they hear. Yes. And students can drown very quickly in a hybrid course, particularly if you have, use adaptive release, because they go to the assignment, they expect the, they go to Blackboard, expect the assignment to be up there, but they haven't done the work in order for this assignment to, to be visible. And so then they email you and say, what did, what did I do wrong? And so uh, that's very difficult once students start to drown too much. Yeah. Uh, it's very difficult for them to, to come back. Um, so preparing them for the difficulties, telling them, look, this assignment online will probably take you an hour, an hour and 15 minutes if you're proficient. I think many, st we presume that the millennial generation is proficient in using the internet. And they are not. They can Google or Bing, depending upon what you want. They can do that. 
but to really get down and dirty into the internet, they're, they're, they're not. Uh, they have their favorite sites, I'm not even gonna say one, but they have their favorite sites where they take everything as the God-given truth. Uh, and so you have to break them out of that. Um, and sometimes, I think the first two weeks we should spend at least trying to break them out of that, uh, to get them you know, affiliated, associated with what the things they have to do in order to be, to be successful in the course. <coughs> I agree with both of what said. I, I have done the um, kind of, in order to take this class, you have to do this quiz, as Tim mentioned. I've also not done it, as Tyson mentioned. Um, I think there's, you know, I guess it's a matter of style. I really like the idea of the syllabus. Yeah. I hadn't done it exactly that way. Um, I think that's a good way to kind of get that message out there. But um, I also have kind of opened it up um, on that on um, discussion board and they need to kind of let me know what their comfort is with that and I, I kind of read through those and then I connect with those students right from the beginning I say if you are not comfortable you know with the technology piece you need to let me know from the get-go that way so that we can kind of already be having an outside discussion about where things are and how things are going I think the other thing is and I know UMBC's policy I don't remember the name of it um, our policy is about technology is is that um, you know, you need to have access to the internet. But the fact is, is that I had a, a several students, about two or three, who didn't have internet access at home that was like high speed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know that, that I, you know, I didn't want to say to them, you can't be in this class then. I knew it was going to make it more difficult. They had to do that stuff at the library, at school, wherever else that was. But I think there are a number of students that don't have that access, and I think um, that we just need to be aware of it because of this whole digital divide. I mean, you know, we know how expensive it is to have internet access at home, especially, you know, $90 a month. I mean, that's a lot of money for our students, you know, to be paying. Now, some of them, it's no big deal. They live with mom and dad. That's not a problem. Others are also, you know, have their own families and spending a lot on other stuff. So I think I was kind of aware of a, a few of those students, who they were. And so I was able to kind of say, hey, if you can't do this, you know, at this point, you need to make sure you're doing it before class or after class. You know, spend time with me here in the lab. Let's kind of connect with this so that we're more comfortable. With the hybrid piece, I also did spend that first class. I said, okay, anyone who kind of isn't doing well, you know, or didn't do so well on the quiz or didn't, doesn't know this material, I kept them for the next or a half hour, hour or so just to kind of review stuff. Um, to make sure they knew where everything was. But I really think delivering that message like, hey, you are expected to be on here um, and be doing the work and be gathering all this information on this site. Um, and it is gonna take time. You know, we have less time in the classroom, right. so they kind of think like, oh, I got, you know, I'm out an hour early, mm -hmm. this is great. But I think, you know, there's expe expectations that they need to be aware of. I guess the other thing is I always kind of feel like there's a few that drop through the class, whether it's face-to-face -face mm -hmm. or, or hybrid. And I don't really know that it was any more, you know, and I don't really know, in, in, my, in my situation, I kind of felt like a few of those students probably would have slipped through the, cra the cracks. I mean, they, were, they weren't gonna make it through that, through that class to begin with, um, unfortunately. I mean, I tried my best, but, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. Well, there is this, uh, for some students, whatever content you're delivering may not work in a hybrid format. Uh, at the end of the course, there were some students who said, this just doesn't work <laughs> um, mm -hmm. in hybrid. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's too content heavy, too assessment heavy, and uh, you know, Bob and I exchanged emails ab about that from time to time. Uh, but some students just said, it's just, it's not working. They would prefer what they call the traditional face-to-face -face, uh, mm -hmm. setting. So that it works in accounting is just wonderful. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, that you just, well, there were two hands up, but I did want to say one thing about that. This summer, I'm teaching an upper division accounting class. Okay. Every kid in that class has decided they wanted to take <coughs> an upper division accounting class. So you have a willing population. Uh, yeah. Uh, that said, this fall, it'll yeah. be the 121, 122 series, the lower division, where 85% of them are there get me through and I'm done with this for life, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that may that be a bit a more of a challenge. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. So yeah. I think it matters whether you're upper division or, or, or one of the 
the requirements that they just got to get past kind of deal? Mm -hmm. Wendy and Britt. Okay, I have a multimedia classroom. Uh, my computer, and they're sitting at those really comfy desks. Mm -hmm. I'm in a computer lab, which has its cons. <laughs> <laughs> um, Facebook is on a lot of screens a lot of times. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a, a difficult. We, we have kind of set this classroom up again only because part of the tutorials are actually going through with them, getting on the library website, going through that stuff, going through websites, you know, going through, um, you know, Code of Federal Regulations, how to find a policy, how to find a bill, you know, getting into Thomas, you know, so I'm actually illustrating it and then they're practicing it right there wi with me. Um, so there's pros and cons to that setup. You know, there's, there's, a, there's several lectures where I wouldn't need to be in a computer lab, which it, it would be nice not to be, but that's where our classroom is reserved, so. I have two questions. One is, um, when you give an exam or a quiz on Blackboard, is there a specific time between which it needs to be taken, and how do you deal with like open book or closed book, or is, do they have a specific time to complete it from when they start, or I mean, how does that kind of work? I got burned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I gave them a 24-hour period, uh, so. You, you, you don't. Uh, you don't. Uh, it's you. You really have to trust the integrity of the students. It's on your syllabus, right there. UMBC's, uh, you know, honor code, uh, and it's a contract between you and the student. Um, so I think 24 hours is a little too long. Uh, so next time will probably be three hours or four hours, not not 24 hours. There's no way you can you can you can know, unless. And this goes back to the assessment. Unless you give an, an essay part, mm -hmm. and then you just simply read to see how the essays look interestingly similar. And then you say, okay, there's something, there's something going on here. If, if I could just jump in on that question. It's a, it's a really important question. And I, I don't know that there's a definitive right way to do it. But what I have been hearing from some faculty is that if you want to do an assessment in Blackboard, or let's say you want to do an assessment online, or let's call it a quiz online, do it in a computer lab. Make them come and be present face to face where you want to be. If you are going to let them do it at home or on their own time, and some faculty won't, won't, won't do this, but make it a practice quiz. Don't make it count for credit. You know, whatever you want to count for credit, make them be present to win. Um, if you don't want to put the time into doing a practice quiz, or that you don't, or if you don't say, if you say to them, you know, questions from the practice quiz may appear on the actual quiz. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. But I, I think you can chase your tail a lot trying to lock this down and make it a foolproof yeah. security device. It isn't there yet. No, no, no. So I think the, the I think the sooner you just sort of accept that condition as a situational factor for your course and say I'm going to make this a practice quiz. Now, if you show the students and they 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 love grade book, they love you know you know seeing what they can get from this stuff. But if you show the students that, you know the the grade distribution of the students who did the practice quizzes versus those who didn't, that's on them to whether that's motivation enough to say, hey, maybe I can get something from this. You know, for those that don't, if you don't want to put that kind of time into it, you know, the folks who, are, who come to the class not prepared well, uh, the, the algebra folks or physics, or I think there was another person who was talking about not being ready in math, or those things. You know, you put the, your time in there to do that. If they don't take advantage of it, you know, I think you've done what you can. But what we have talked about often is that in a hybrid course, more responsibility for the learning is shouldered by the students. Whether yeah. or not they choose to do that, you, know, you can't make them. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. I just be careful of trying to go down the path of I'm going to make this super secure. Because as far as I can tell right now, you can't. Okay. Uh, let me 
even in the classroom, I pass mm -hmm. out two to three different exams. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. mm -hmm. And often they just have a slight reversal yeah. of the question, so somebody right. looks they get it wrong. Mm -hmm. On Blackboard, can I have two to four exams yeah. randomly? Yeah, you, you can do chosen? randomization yeah. of the questions yeah. of both the order yeah. and right. questions <laughs> and, and answers. Oh, I'm, great. I'm, okay. I'm sorry, I interrupted yeah. your second question. That would question. really help, because then they couldn't really yeah. help each other. Mm -hmm. and, and then the next, it kind of leads into the next part, which is classroom time versus online time or whatever. If you have kind of a scheduled classroom <coughs> time, I guess you could use maybe that class time to say, okay, everyone is going to take an exam or yeah. a quiz or right. whatever at 10 a.m., wherever you are in the world. <laughs> And you're going to have 15 minutes to do it, or whatever, or you know, 50 minutes or whatever. So something like that could also be a, a way of dealing with it, maybe. Or yeah. and then and then that kind of leads into the other question: is how often do you meet for credit, or and how like what's the split between online to face-to-face -face time? Okay, there's several answers to your yeah. question. That's yeah, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, in my case, it's uh, it used to be 100 percent in. Now it's 50 out, 50 in. Mm -hmm. Number two, we meet once a week, even in summer school. The first week we meet twice, and after that it's once a week. Winter school, we would meet once a week, but only for 75 minutes for a three-hour class, or 90 minutes, whatever it is. The, the, that's it. In my case, on those assessments, the accounting world has some real advantages uh, in this way, if you think about what you're asking them to do, what I'm asking them to do, there's the conceptual part and there's the problem part. The gateway things that I talked about before are untimed, unrestricted. They can do them as many times as they want, but every time they come up, they get the same questions, but in a different order. So they have to slow down and read. They have figured out that it's more efficient for them to do it right the first time <laughs> than to have to go back and do it again. Once they've done that, then they have a timed uh, assessment that they get one shot. They have the full week to do it. They can do it any time they want, but they get 30 minutes, one time, and that counts. Then we go to solving the problems that they have to do. They do the problems online, and I will admit we go to the uh, publisher's site for that, but everybody gets the same problems and they can do them as many times as they want. Then we come to class and we talk about those problems. Then they go back and the publishers provide an algorithmic set of problems that are exactly the same problems but everybody gets different numbers. So if you and your friend are sitting side by side, and again, that one's timed, you have one hour for that, and you get one shot. And your sales are 48, and yours are 32, and 73, and 96, and the friends all of a sudden aren't willing to help one another, even if they're sitting <laughs> side by side. But the algorithmic ones solve that, but the tests, are in class, and I scramble them just like you do. Same right. questions, but if you look at your buddies, you're you're toast. Yeah. But those are in class. You had a question. I was going to say that, that I have used the publisher's test bank, you know, for my online course, and they do, you know, whether it's four hours, three hours, and they only get, as you said, one shot where they log in. Mm -hmm. That username, there's two usernames, and once they log in, the clock starts ticking down for them, and they can't log back in again. So they can do it within. They can do it any day of the week, they can do it for four hours. It doesn't. So either way. So I mean, there are ways to. Do it. <coughs> How do you handle the case where they're doing it at home and their kid falls and hurts himself, mm -hmm. and so right in the middle of tests, they got to yeah. take him to the hospital? Can they come in and? Be Well, I, I would stress uh, be flexible because it, let's say you have a timed exam and they all have to take it at whenever time and you have 30 students, they're all trying to take that exam, Blackboard, 
is known to freeze up yeah. sometimes. Um, and so you could, you could say, well, that's on you. Or you could say, well, I, I understand and clear them. And, uh, and if you randomize the questions and if you randomize the answers, then uh, whatever they did previously won't come up in the same way. But just, just remain flexible. Uh, I know there were a few times email Bob, Bob, <laughs> Blackboard is frozen. And it's frozen for me, too. So I know I can't get into it. And so Bob is very helpful. He's Let a lifeline. Let me put one more wrinkle on that, because I give them a long time like you do. They have from cla when class is over this week to when class begins next week. <laughs> and that's what they have. If they leave it till the last minute, <laughs> it's on them. Okay. If they do it a little earlier and have trouble, they can send me an email and I can go clear their attempt. <laughs> That's funny. So it's up to them. Okay. Okay. That's right. Blackboard does have an attempt. Yeah. Yes. For right. the class time, yeah. I know you, you, I think that's a really hard, you know, I, I struggled with that when I first went through this training. I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Um, I, I think that it does for me, I think it should vary, you know, class to class uh, or course to course and also almost class to class, like what material I'm covering. There's been days when I feel like we need a little more time face to face and then there's been others when we get through the material pretty, pretty quick, they're understanding what's going on and they're following through. I've done 50-50 um, as um, Tim mentioned. So what I try to do is I have, what is it, two hours and 45 minutes or three, oh, I consider it like three hours in the classroom um, for a three credit class. So I meet, um, my class was only held weekly. So once a week I was held. And so we met every week because I felt like that was important for me to stay in touch with them. Um, and um, I met for about an hour and a half each class period. So they got out about an hour early each class period. Um, and then that, uh, you know, we talked about how that extra hour could be used then in right there. And when we were in the computer lab, if you have questions, I can stay and answer them. Not only that, you can even do your assignment for next week kind of right here or do some of the readings or whatever. Um, I found a lot of them coming in before class started and I think they were doing, you know, reading or whatever then, which, you know, whatever, as long as it was getting done. So for me, that kind of worked. And then what did you give them to work on on the online side of it? So you had the face-to-face <coughs> -face meeting, and then between the next time you met, what were right. you expected to do I, I was a, I like Camtasia <laughs> a little too much. Um, so I did make um, video lectures and, you know, maybe five to eight minutes kind of trying to deliver a pre-message to them or a message of, of some sort that I wanted them to think about. Um, I also posted readings, um, whether it be from websites or actual PDF files, you know, articles that I have found that I put in there. Um, and the expectation was is that they would do those readings, review the lecture, and post on discussion board right. within right. the week you know, between classes, so to speak. Right. Now you say post, does, does uh, Blackboard have the ability of monitoring the post? I'm assuming you give them a grade for posting. I, di I did. Um, I, what I did what's called a participation portfolio. So they were, to, they were to post pretty much each week. And then at the end of the semester, they were to collect their top posts, ones where they didn't just say, hey, I agree with you. It was ones where they made a connection to the readings, to the class discussion, to an article that they somehow make, or even a student's previous post. Maybe I'm posting on right. you know, what Tyson just said, I agree with, but what I found in the article was this, this, and this. So somehow drawing in on several points. Um, that's how they could score the most points. And then of course they scored the least points by just saying, yeah, I agree with Tyson. So you got control of the amount of points that each post was worth. Right. So, and they, it was their, their assignment was to go back, collect those posts. They had to include their name, you know, the date that it was posted, the message that was posted, and they had to copy and paste that into a document, a Word document. And then they graded it themselves. So I had them give themselves their own grade. Of course, I went through and changed several of those, um, you know, based on what best, I felt. Sure. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, some of those, um, I think that happened once. The other ones was more on the downside. Um, but you went, I went through and kind of what I felt was um, appropriate that way. Um, I also used the discussion board portfolio. Yeah. Um, so there were eight weeks, eight, eight discussion board posts, and they could use four the first week, and then uh, four the first part, and then four the second part. 
But also, in terms of your question about, uh, it was 60-40, but I also use virtual classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so virtual classroom is where they all come in and they're all online, you're in a class at the same time, there's a whiteboard there, you can, you know, um, make drawings and, and do stuff. You can also say, okay, I've just uploaded this to Blackboard if someone had a question or a comment. And so they were in person, face-to-face -face meeting with me, but they were also in a virtual classroom with me and they could be anywhere in the world uh, doing that. And then we met usually in person after the virtual classroom to say, okay, what did you get out of it? How did you, and you can record the virtual classroom uh, session as well. So someone who misses it for whatever reason, uh, they can also go back and yeah. see what happened. Great participation in the virtual classroom. I mean, for example, you're able to see who's logging in yes. and whether they're participating. Yes. And students can tell you maybe why they didn't participate. Or absolutely, them. absolutely. You know, your, your question is a good one because yeah. it's one that um, I, I think we're weak on mm -hmm. as a university. Uh, we, you know, we're spending all of this time to help get you folks just thinking about what you might do. Right. But there's no sort of pre-assessment or sort of pre-tutorial yeah. or guidance. Uh, you know, what, what I have seen from University of Maryland, University College, and I've seen it repeated, right at several other campuses is sort of a, is online learning right for me? Kind of self-assessment mm. that uh, I would, I've been wanting to see us do here. You know, for the, for the most part though, we need to have more online learning. It's sort of a chicken and egg problem. You know, sure. if there isn't enough interest, it's hard to kind of develop the, the tutorial or the time. But um, I think at this point, it's gonna have to be at a course level Mm -hmm. where, where, where folks, I think it's sort of like taking Tim's three weeks out, you know, kind of thing and saying, you know, you ought to see what this is like or, you know, the problem Katie's dealing with, with uh, high speed internet. Um, all of these are problems, but, you know, at some point you have to say, how do I want to run my course? And how, what is sort of the minimum level of engagement or responsibility that I, I have to expect from the students in order for the course to function? And I, I think what some faculty sometimes struggle with is sort of drawing and sticking to that line. Mm -hmm. but, but at least with UNUC, and not that you know, I'm proud of them, but part of UNUC is they have website posts, and they also have the tech support for website posts. So I know I've never had to answer how fast is your internet or that type of stuff. Well, this, this, is, this, is, uh, this is a challenge that we're facing, and, and it's, it's one of the mm -hmm. implicit challenges that I, I struggle with is that the more you folks start doing with the technology, whether you like it or not, you end up being your own technical support yeah. for your course. Okay. And I, I think about that very seriously because I know you, you are subject matter experts in your disciplines, <laughs> not IT support people. Right. So <clears throat> that's why Bob and I spend a lot of time, we try to identify technologies that for the most part can be stable now, when we have some hiccups, it creates a ripple effect for all of us, and it's a challenge. And as we have more problems with that, we tend to steer away from that or kind of not step on the gas quite as much in terms of trying to promote them. But it is an implicit understanding that I don't know is the right one, is that the faculty sort of end up being the technical support. Now, I will tell you this, that in the last year, uh, right now, it's pretty much just Bob and I, and actually, it's pretty much just Bob. <laughs> uh, that supports Blackboard. But this last year, we, we conducted a pilot, and now it's, it's become official, that we trained our help desk, the IT help desk, uh, to handle basic tier level, uh, tier one level kinds of uh, requests. Typically, it's at the beginning of the semester, you know, I can't log in, you know, I forgot my user ID and password, or I've had an assessment problem or something like that. Increasingly, the help desk is taking on more of those kinds of things. It's a challenge because we don't have many full-time staff, I think probably three full-time staff, uh, four or three. So we have a lot of students, so we train them, they leave. Uh, it becomes a real you know, challenge. What I, I do like that I've heard from one prof, 
uh, has the sort of three before me uh, guide that, you know, before you ask me, you have to uh, ask and or answer the question about the class discussion posting. Um, you have to contact the help desk or you have to look at the student manual that is inside a blackboard. And when you call me or contact me, I'm going to ask you which one, you know, which of those three or two out of three did you do before I'll help you. You know, it, I'm not unsympathetic to the problem, you know, that you get hit with the technical questions, but the only advantage, the only advantage I would say with the hybrid learning um, is that you have the opportunity in advance to develop the course and structure it so that you sort of set the conditions and the rules of engagement for how you're going to work. Mm -hmm. If you go into a hybrid course not having those things thought through and articulated, yeah. you'll get you'll pumped. Suck. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, you know, when you're in the course, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late to kind of wing it. You can, you can pull, you can get away with that on a face-to-face yeah, -face course can. in some ways. But in a hybrid course where you are less meeting time, you really have to commit in advance to what are sort of the conditions that you want the students to learn and under. And I will tell you right now, you won't have it right the first time. Yeah. You're right, absolutely. So yeah. don't stress about that. Yep. Get through it, learn from it, yep. and then Make stick with the process for the second and third time because that's when the payoff comes. Yeah. Uh, some of the uh, video lectures that Katie's been doing, I, you know, I don't know that you would reuse the, all of them all the time, but you start to, it becomes easier to do it, and the upfront course development time doesn't take as long. But yeah. you're asking, I mean, what you're asking is very real, and in a course like yours, 85 students, yeah. you know, it's a real problem. When I send out an email and you grab one, I think, at 10 to 12, and, and I see them the next day, I said, okay, so did you all get my email? Dang bad. That's, I tell them they have to, that they have to contact me through their UMBC email because a lot of times it'll go right to spam if it comes from a dot com or whatever. Gmail. Gmail, like yeah. Gmail is pretty good. But um, they have to contact me through their UMBC and they need to be checking their UMBC at least, at least, definitely before class starts um, and at least once or twice That's a week. That's the upfront rule. Yeah, I yeah. have a rule check Blackboard and email, and email at least three times a day. Um, at least three times a day. And sometimes I'll just send them an email, respond yeah, back, by, please. By default, all the accounts that are in Blackboard have the umbc.edu yep. address right. Right. in right. there. Right. So if they're using their Gmail account, they can always go into my UMBC and forward, forward it. it. Right. Yeah. Right. They can do yeah. that, yeah. but if, if they, they don't. don't know to do that and they don't check their UMBC yeah. mail, then that could be why they're not getting yeah. it. Yeah. That could, be, that could be a little video snippet. Here's how to forward yep. your, your yeah. UMBC yeah. email yeah. to yeah. Gmail. Yeah. Yeah. That could be a real lifesaver, actually, yeah. for you know, the start of the course. A couple of things I'd add to what John said. On the first day of class, because they may not be comfy with Blackboard, I showed them yes. how to use it. I did that too, but. And that, I mean, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. <laughs> the second yeah. is, I learned kind of the hard way. I, I say in one of the things they have to download that we use these pieces of software. We use Excel 2007, mm. right. not 2003, 2003 not right. Mac version. I don't care. And I learned to only use the ones that are in the labs. Mm. And that's for the ones that want to do something here and don't have a laptop or whatever. Yeah. And if they send me something and something else, I just refuse it. But I laid that down in the beginning. Um, and uh, just a comment about the email, because I tested it this uh, summer. Sometimes I put an announcement up, and when you put an announcement in Blackboard, there's a little box to check, right. send an email. email. <laughs> that doesn't work. All the time. Does it work? does not work. Not all the time. <laughs> we, yeah, we have. <laughs> I don't get so you, yeah. if you put an announcement up, you have to go to the communication uh, side. Copy and paste it. Yeah, we'll <laughs> good, good. I, we're running out of time. I know Christy yeah, had a question, so I want to get my, my question is, how do you take your video lectures and, for example, what if we have a speaker come into the classroom and we'd like to
to tape it and post it for students who maybe didn't attend the class? Or how, how can we have support? That uh, that's going to be a little challenging. Uh, there is a, uh, Rebecca works for uh, a group in our office, uh, for a fee. We will tape it for you. If that fee is one you want to pay, we'll do it. If it's not, then you got to figure out another way. So how do you tape yours then through? Yeah, through Camtasia. We're going to show we're that. Gonna, we're this is oh, sort of yeah, a self. Thing. So we'll show you some yeah, of that. This is sort of yeah. a self, yeah. you know, do it yourself here. I have one last idea. question that I, I have to get in here. Um, these folks are going to be participating in a fall version uh, for, for high group. Yes. Okay. And uh, particularly, I want to direct this to Tyson. Uh, Katie, I can't remember, you know, kind of in terms of course size, but Tyson, when we have worked with you in the summer and winter, uh, and I think you went through the winter 2007 right. uh, group, uh, the course size I remember being around the 25. Now we have a course uh, scheduling problem of uh, enrollments between 40 and 80. Your course, I think, is around 43 or 45 or something it's like that. It's capped at 49, okay. so I remember. <laughs> Could you just talk to me a little bit about what changes, if any, you see yourself having to do to deal with a larger class mm -hmm. than what you have done in the past as a hybrid course? Uh, more assessments that are not graded <laughs> or self-graded. Or, self. or, or, or self-graded, um, that's number one. Uh, Number two, I will probably uh, limit the length of time for the online assi assignments. So I usually time them out at between 30 and 45 minutes. Now I'll make them 10 or 15 minutes uh, because I don't want students to get so frustrated that they just drop out either virtually or actually uh, of the course. Um, the other thing is I'm going to go to virtual classroom a lot more. Okay. Um, and so It'll be a hybrid course, but I don't think they'll be able to see really diff real differences between face-to-face -face because I'm going to be interacting with them uh, at the same time through virtual classroom. Um, so uh, I don't know where they'll be, but they may be in a computer lab or on, in the library. Uh, that, that's what I'll do. Um, with a larger course, uh, I think you need more feedback, more amount of time that you have feedback to, to the students. Uh, because they may feel lost when they come into the face-to-face -face setting. Uh, so the face-to-face -face setting will be on Thursday. Uh, the hybrid virtual classroom will be on, on Tuesday. Uh, so I'm going to do that more often. Have you considered Wimba? Or, or you just are, you're, you like the virtual classroom and that's working for you? I'm not that tech savvy. Okay. So <laughs> we might want to catch up sometime to okay. talk about Wimba. Okay. Um, similar kinds of functions, but uh, might have some advantages as well. Katie, okay. go ahead. Yeah, I know we have to end, but I just want to um, stress too what uh, what was John was mentioning is is how important it is to set up your Blackboard course definitely in advance and to to set it up in a clear fashion, if that makes sense, um, and to even get feedback, whether it be from a, a previous student or a peer or someone. Um, the thing is, is that when that is your half of the way you're delivering a message, in our own minds, I think we set up like, oh, this is so clear. And then I have students go, well, where is that? I'm like, under the assignments tab. What made you think you wouldn't be, you know? But I think that idea of really, you know, what, what I think what our messages are, how we find it all structured is one way, but are our students going to see it the same way? And so I guess I can't stress enough that, again, if half of your course is being delivered on Blackboard, making sure that that is set up in a clear fashion, then and whether it be getting a previous student or something else to give you feedback on that really does help. I mean, I think that's what's helped me. John, as John said, you go through that first semester and usually there's several oomphs that you make along the way, but I think you learn from that. And that was one thing that I definitely learned, that students couldn't find some of the stuff that I thought was so clear. Um, so. Jim, I have, last word. Okay, I have uh, one thought and one suggestion for you. The thought is, Boy, will this get you to think about what you've been doing and turn your, it, you'll, it'll turn you upside down. Yeah. Uh, don't lose sleep over it. It all works out. <laughs> all right. Uh, join me in thanking these folks. For getting oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You never know. That's great. <laughs>